So we are at a research university. This is a side project for us. Um, and so I know that's like a very daunting thing because this could absolutely be the full like focus of any organization. Um, so they have funded this portion of our work. They help support some of our, our graduate students or interns, but most of our funding comes from grants and our research grants. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned having a learning exchange. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be through the university, or how do you guys set that up? How do you manage it? Yeah. Do you have any interest in it? Like That's a great question. So we do learning exchanges with some of our other colleagues and collaborators in the Caribbean, but one of the things that we're working on with Livongo is that um, some of our interns are funded by Livongo, and so they go and do educational outreach at the resort. And that's definitely in the development. That's something we haven't been able to do as frequently as we would like to. Um, but I know they are really receptive. And so that, at least at the bare minimum, is where we're trying to get to of having a more frequent presence of some of our interns, some of our technicians there. Um, but also working with them to eventually get a staff who is des like designated to have a better understanding of some of the like environmental work that's going around in Virgin Islands. Excellent. Well, congrats. I hope that that awesome. gains some traction Thank you so much. You. Appreciate it. All right. We've got a lot to figure out today. Yeah. Last but not least, <laughs> I hope. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for hanging on for the last talk before lunch. Much appreciated. Um, I'll be giving you a little bit of a perspective in terms of what's happening with coral reef restoration in the Maldives, so taking you a little bit away from the Caribbean uh, into other coral-rich places in the world. So my name is Inga Dinat. I just completed my PhD with the University of Milano Bicocca in Italy. So, of course, Italy is well known for its amazing food, but not so much for its tropical coral reefs. Uh, however, we do have a collaboration with the Maldivian government, and we've been working uh, at a research station, which is Mara Center, uh, owned by the university for over 10 years now in the Maldives. And we also have a collaboration with Plan Hotel Hospitality Group. So. Let me start by telling you a little bit of what must be the most amazing workplace on Earth, at least if you are a marine biologist, the Maldives. So Maldives are a low-lying archipelago in the Indian Ocean, so just over there. And it's literally a nation that is made out of coral reefs. So therefore, it's no surprise that the national economy highly depends on healthy coral reefs. Um, as fisheries and tourism are one of their main sources of income. So in the Maldives, we have about 1,200 islands and just about 160 of these are exclusively resort islands only for tourism. In addition to that, we have close to another 190 local islands, including Male capital, uh, which is one of the most densely populated places in the world. Now, Maldives lies about one meter above sea level, so therefore it's also kind of the poster child when it comes to nations being threatened by climate change. So you think Maldives must be a hotspot for coral reef restoration. Truth is, we have very little coral reef restoration, especially considering that this is a fast and globally accelerating discipline. It's very little regional projects. When we started a few years back, most of the literature, the peer-reviewed literature, dated back to the 1990s. And even until today, um, all the projects are typically small scale, they're tourism based, um, they're mainly educational, and there's very little information uh, about the success stories or uh, unsuccessful stories of these projects in the literature. In addition to that, we have, unlike most countries, we've been hearing about very little community-led projects. So again, most of the efforts are tourism-based. So back in 2016, we experienced the extreme um, effects of the mass bleaching. It's estimated that we lost about 70% of our shallow water corals, so a huge impact for the Maldives. And this was kind of a bit of a wake-up call for us at Mario Center as well to start doing something um, in order to get coral reef restoration going. So we had the first workshop back in 2017 
with the help of Fano from Corales Pass, um, bringing some of that knowledge and some of that experience that uh, is already available in the community to the Maldives. So it soon became clear that we really needed to step up restoration in the Maldives. And uh, the best way to go about it is really through the tourism industry. It's well established in the Maldives. Um, it's high value. And so we started to uh, partner up with the Plan Hotel Hospitality Group, which has several properties across the Maldives. And we really wanted to base our uh, restoration efforts in collaboration with the tourism industry on awareness, but also trying to propagate active research and get the information out there. So just the, the first pillar, the awareness part, everyone uh, uh, who works in tourism will know that it's much easier to approach people and to talk to them about scientific and environmental issues when they're on holiday. You know, they're relaxed, they're away from their everyday problems, so they're much more approachable. So we're using that um, and we throw a whole array of educational measures at them. Um, so we have workshops where they can actively participate. We do talks in places uh, where there's happy hours so they get exposed to that knowledge whether they want to or not. <laughs> and uh, we have a whole range of adaptation and, uh, sorry, adaptation programs. So uh, no matter whether you can snorkel or not, you can adopt a small coral that you can name and get as a souvenir. Um, at least the picture, not the coral, <laughs> um, which you can plan out with us to adopting um, the coral frames or spiders all the way up to nursery. So everything is up for adoption and we can follow up that way with the customers and make sure we have longer lasting impacts. We're also monitoring our impact by using guest service and trying to improve our impact on these people in the long term. So this is the one side, um, the awareness and education, which cannot be stressed enough. It's super important, as we've heard before. But we also needed to get a grip on the research side of things. And uh, spoiler alert, I'm not going to tell you about the next amazing method that we can use in order to save the reefs. Um, in the Maldives, it's all back to the basics, yeah, because we really have very little information on what works and what doesn't. So we were thinking about, okay, how can we scale up restoration in an ecological, meaningful way um, with the resources that are available? And uh, no huge surprise, coral gardening was kind of the method to go with, but no information around. So uh, our aims in terms of research were really to understand what are the, the regional um, problems and uh, conclusions that we can draw from this. Can we have some, some regional, regional benchmarks at least to see what is working, what is not working, in order to provide some information for the many practitioners around that are really keen to do restoration, but don't really know how to do it. So um, we put out a couple of nurseries using two different designs, um, the classic lagoon design, um, but we also put out some of the Maldivian inshore reefs where we have more currents, so we adjusted the design a little bit and we just wanted to see how they perform. So we monitored close to 2,000 fragments of Acropora, Poslopora and Poritis um, over several years using a common monitoring protocol in order to see what are the differences between the atolls, so the different locations. We have here these different rings, these are atolls in the Maldives, but also what are the differences between farming habitats? Should I put my nursery out on the reef? or should I put it in the lagoon, which lagoons are suitable. So we did a lot of testing around these, and just to give you a couple of key findings, there's a lot more, but don't have time to go into that. So um, just a really high fragment survival, which was really encouraging for us, um, but we did find differences between health and coral growth between the sites. So again, it's all about location. And uh, for those of you uh, who haven't tried, pruritus is really bad choice for your coral reefs, uh, for your coral nurseries. So we had really low survival and uh, fistula predation there. So um, we disencourage people to using that. In terms of looking at different habitats, um, we uh, compared our reef with our lagoon nurseries using the same genotypes, growing them in both habitats, finding that Acropora generally did really well in the reef sites. And the reef nurseries also had the advantage of giving us different growing depths, so we could go all the way down to 18 meters and growing corals there. Uh, while the lagoon Postlopora was really the winner, um, it did extremely well. Uh, we had more uh, mutualistic fauna and fish predation there as well, but really disease was an issue. Yes, we do have disease also in the Maldives, different types, 
And it's a bit more tricky to actually understand what it is because there's very little research on disease assessment in the Maldives. So uh, therefore, it's just classified as white syndrome for now. Um, but definitely one of the challenges and one of the risks for restoration. So uh, just to, to show you what happened to our four uh, nursery stocks of Postlopora and Acropora across time, about, about a year, um, we wanted to see what's the impact of disease uh, if we don't do anything about it. So it was painful to watch, but we just let the disease spread through our nursery in order to see what's the economic impact of that. And we found that for Postlopora on the reef, uh, we had about 6% uh, that were affected after one year, while lagoon stock of the same genotypes was totally fine. Uh, vice versa for the Acropora, they survived really well on the reef. But look at that, the lagoon stock, 88%. This is a really bad outcome for any of you that uh, have looked after a nursery for one year. <laughs> so basically that stock was useless to us after one year. Um, so one year of uh, maintenance and monitoring wasted on that one, showing that really um, it has a potential impact to, um, to your nursing success. So again, it's a little bit about species and location selection here. Another challenge that many people probably know about, it's really difficult to do restoration during a pandemic, right? So um, uh, we kind of uh, face the same issues because we are closely tied to the tourism industry that was shut down, so were we. So um, we had interruptions of our monitoring and maintenance protocol. Uh, we put these um, experiences together as part of a wider study, but for us in the Maldives, our nurseries were left alone for somewhere between 29 weeks to almost a year, or 61 uh, weeks, actually. And uh, depending on what we did to the structure in the first place, or so whether we were able to um, give it a little bit of prep and preparation to, um, to survive these extended periods some of them were totally fine um, and they survived with almost no damage while other ones left for a year or so uh, obviously they um, ground, were grounded and we had a significant loss of data and experiment uh, experimental results as a uh, as an outcome so um, the, really the take-home message here was to um, make sure that if you're in these remote places, have contingency plans in place. Make sure that if for some reason um, these disturbing events are happening, um, that at least you're not going to lose your entire project. So I also want to bring some positive news up here, so at least a, a little bit of a success story. We looked at the ecological impacts of our outplanting activities. So the first one, uh, the first outplanting activity that we did was on one of our resorts, House Reef. Um, beautiful House Reef, once upon a time. Um, not so nice anymore uh, after the bleaching event. And it showed really low natural recovery. So this was a prime target for our restoration effort. Um, it was fairly, the study is actually fairly small scale and uh, short term, so we're just um, publishing some of these results after one year, but it really showed that our planting success was 72%, uh, which was not too bad. And looking at the different outplanting depths, we found that obviously colony grew a bit slower as we put them deeper, but also Drupella predation really decreased uh, as we went deeper, but we had more issues with coral rubble. Um, the most important thing and the, the uh, encouraging thing is that we could show that on our outplanting sites, we had higher and more fish communities and also more increased natural coral cover compared to our <coughs> control sites. So this really helped us to guide the next run of uh, outplanting sessions, which we've been doing this year, prioritizing mainly the shallow reef slope, given the results that we had from the first study. And uh, so far, we've been transplanting about a thousand corals to this house reef, and we will monitor um, that in the long term. So take home message, um, there's a huge potential for in the Maldives for um, working together with the tourism industry if you want to scale up restoration. Um, they have all the infrastructure, as we've already heard. We have marine biologists on most of the islands, so um, they want to do something, but we need to show them a little bit how to do it. Uh, it's a great awareness tool as well, and it can facilitate research, as shown by the research that we were able to, to put out. So. Um, 
In our case, it's the regional first regional validation and benchmarks for coral gardening in the Maldives that we are able to provide open access um, to all the restoration practitioners. And we could also show that there's some socioeconomic benefits, which is really important if you want to persuade um, a resort to engage in coral reef restoration. Uh, we put this all together in a national monitoring manu manual, which is available uh, free for any practitioners, includes a ready to use monitoring slides. And we're also uh, running uh, another version of our workshop um, next September, uh, sorry, next January, uh, where we'll be uh, encouraging this. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, these are just all the publications I tried to squeeze in this short talk. And uh, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? I have a brief one then. Um, you may not know the answer to this, that's fine, uh, but you mentioned a big fan of surveys, obviously. What are you asking them, and have you been able to implement any of the feedback? Um, so we've been looking at different aspects. So one of it is how much do guests value um, reefs as a, as a service or as a part of their holiday and their experience, which is really important if you want to persuade um, the tourism industry and show them, look, this is... The, the, the reef or the snorkeling on a healthy reef is the highest priority uh, of guests that are coming. So um, this is one part that we've been looking at. But we're also um, doing smaller surveys for all the different adoption programs and the experience that we do in order to see what people have learned and uh, if they have any small or long-term changes in their behavior as a result. So it's, we're looking at multiple things um, to improve our services, but also to see if we make an impact. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions before we end the session for the day and everyone scampers <laughs> off for lunch? All right. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs> and, uh, I'll see you in